Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm really excited to have with us today Christopher Pallotta, the founder and CEO at Templum. Templum is a really interesting company focused on alternative investments and private markets, as well as has an early history in digital assets. And so I'm excited to learn more about its journey and the transformation. With that, Christopher, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Lex. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's start off with a bit of background as to how you got to the investment industry. What were some of your early experiences with investment management and what pulled you towards private markets? Started off college, going down the business school route at UNC. So never somebody who loved school and wanted to get into to work as quickly as possible and ended up transferring to NYU where I could work while also being in school. It was at that time I started getting a little bit of a taste of tech and started taking some courses at NYU around technology. And there was a speaker that came in, Lawrence Lessig, who gave a talk and it was basically coder be coded. Right. He basically describing the importance of understanding how technology and code worked in order to interpret the modern world, whether that's a Google algorithm to social to algorithmic trading, whatever it may be. So always wanted to be in the investment world. My dad was a you know very successful hedge fund manager, you know, one of the first long short funds to exist. And you know, he also is one of those guys who seeded Two Sigma, one of the first algorithmic trading companies. And so at that point, I started really seeing the intersection between technology and investing and quickly wound up on the venture capital side, working for a firm called ENIAC, which was the first social local mobile venture capital firm out of New York. After that, I then went out to the West Coast to work for Joe Lonsdale, who founded Palantir. Was in a really unique position because he was setting up Formation 8, which is now 8BC. And he was also an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur who created many companies like you know Adapar and Zambato. And those are some of the very early fintech companies in this latest wave of, of financial technology. So that's kind of you know where I started cutting my teeth and being able to be on the ground floor, literally sitting on his you know living room floor in Los Gatos, you know whiteboarding around these companies as they were being built. Then I kind of took a little bit of a deviation, went to MIT to work at the lab, the media lab for the director, and where I was you know, helping to commercialize technologies developed inside the lab, everything from hardware to software really unique position. There's about 100 member companies, all Fortune 500, that really use that space as outsourced R&D. So stuff like Google Glass had come out of there, a lot of biometronic technology. And then that's where I started getting my first taste around blockchain. And at that time, it was before a lot of tokens were around. So it was more infrastructure. The Bitcoin core devs were there. So I started really getting interested in that technology. Shortly... Towards the end of that, I was asked by the director and a, a few of his other counterparts and some Silicon Valley names, as you know, to start a fund, venture fund, then got sucked into Raptor, which is a private investment group, and to be able to really build companies from the ground up, incubate companies, and then invest in venture. So went over there, you know, was investing primarily in early stage technology, everything you know, from fintech to blockchain to consumer sports and media technology, very broad, broad set of spaces, you know, geographically agnostic. While I was there, we I started seeing what was happening around the ICOs. And that's kind of where Templin was born out of and the intersection between technology and, and regulation. 
Super interesting journey. And for me, there is kind of a, a really interesting line also in between the different markets that you've touched. So, you know, early stage venture, but then thinking about the background of quantitative public markets to kind of pre-commercialization technology that needs to be taken out of concept phase to actually launching it. And of course, to blockchain and ICOs, which is public floating exposure to what in the past would have been just illiquid venture equity. How do you think about, I don't even know the way to ask this, but something like the liquidity journey or like the association between the liquidity of of equity or exposure to the theme and then like how baked it is, how early stage it is. Should liquidity be sort of saved up only for things that are mature and cash flow generating or is it fantastic that we can fractionalize and make liquid what previously weren't liquid assets? How do you think about that having been in the intersection of these different markets? So it depends on what side of the table you're currently sitting at, right? So if you're on, let's say, the asset management side or you know a participant in the existing infrastructure today, it's pretty fragmented, pretty illiquid, they'll, they'll probably say status quo is all right. If you're on the other side, where you know you're unable to access it, it's going to be the opposite, right? And so I'll draw an example of what happened with electronification of markets in the 70s and then the proliferation of capital markets, but then also decimalization, right? That's sometimes overlooked and how important that was. So before decimalization, the public equity markets, it was all fractions on the back end. And what you had were these big spreads, right? And these big fees were able to be captured by the brokers and the market makers. Decimalization happened. That then allowed for a better understanding for your average person because you weren't dealing with fractions, you were dealing with decimals. But also the decimals, because there weren't these big spreads in the fractions, you were able to actually have tighter spreads, right? Which then caused more competition amongst the market makers. So that means reduced fees for you know, your average investor that's coming into the market. So I think over time, liquidity is a huge benefit. What was the point of Templum and what happened with it coming into sort of the early Ethereum days and through thereafter? Around 2017, you started having this proliferation of ICOs. And a lot of them at the time looked a lot like securities, right? And you can point to the Howey test, for example. So you know, we wanted to get ahead of it and create a regulated infrastructure for investor protection, but then also a venue to help continue the adoption of the various tokens that were coming to market. What ended up happening were, you know, a couple of things. One, people were fighting the existing regulation, you know, using the existing securities framework, didn't necessarily work with some of the business models that were being developed or in place at the time. When you started seeing people wanting to do security tokens, right, they would also, again, go offshore to avoid the regulation. And then we started seeing these assets that really were just using blockchain or, or tokens as a way to raise capital where they couldn't raise through traditional means, right? So these were subpar assets. So that's why we ended up making a change into what Templum is today. And what is that today? As we're building out the broker-dealer and alternative trading system, the technology to support the trading of you know, regulated tokenized securities, you know, we realized a few of the things were shifting in the market. But also what we developed it was something very, very complex and something very, very valuable. Right. So between the broker-dealer, the ATS, and the technology, you know, that's typically you know, two, three-year process minimum from a regulatory and technology standpoint to develop. There are a lot of people in alternative assets that wanted to create their own markets. And we just saw how, how alternative asset markets were very fragmented at the time and inaccessible to a lot of people. So what we did is we developed, you know, as compared to Shopify, a model like that where we would be able to white label or via API, have people utilize our technology as well as be able to utilize the broker dealer and alternative trading rails, right? So for primary issuance and secondary trading to do it in a compliant manner. So we took what is typically, you know, three years and tens of millions of dollars at best down to a matter of weeks and a fraction of the cost for people. Right. And so, you know, what we've seen, and especially over 
the last several years and the pandemic and COVID is a huge boom in the alternative asset marketplaces, whether it's anything from real estate to artwork to collectibles to agriculture, you know, the list goes on and on. And so Templum sits in the forefront of being able to power that for individual marketplaces. But we've taken it a step further in being able to connect all of the different participants in the alternative asset space. So not only will these assets live on their own isolated island, they're distributable through and viewable and executable through, say, fintech platforms, RIA channels, independent broker dealers, family office investment platforms, online brokerage accounts, so on and so forth, with the goal of making investing in alternative assets as ubiquitous as investing in public equities. So we're really the operating structure, operating system, and infrastructure layer for the alternative asset ecosystem. Right. So again, connecting marketplaces, asset owners, institutions, distribution channels, transfer agents, custodians, all the different fragmented pieces, and now putting into one single framework to be able to communicate seamlessly. Gotcha. So maybe we can take a step back and open up all these terms and compare infrastructures. Can you explain from like a naive point of view, what is the infrastructure the industry value chain look like for public equities? So like, I want to trade a stock, you know, because you've got the exchange and the broker dealer and the advisor, the fiduciary, and then you've got the settlement side and the custody side, like what's all that stuff? Why does it exist? And then the alternate world, the different reality, which you've described for assets that are not traded in those markets, you know, that don't make it there, that historically haven't been able to be traded around very easily. What are these things that you're talking about in relation to an ATS and, you know, the licensing that you got? And maybe we can paint a picture of what the two different worlds are and kind of how you've moved it forward. Yeah. So, you know, from what we create on the private side, it's actually fairly similar to what occurs in the public markets, right? So, you know, an individual as, you know, say their fidelity account, their online brokerage account, you're able to buy and sell securities through that account, right? And they're held inside of securities are held inside of your brokerage account. So is cash on the back end also sits a custodian. In addition, you have transfer agents that are moving the books and records of, you know, who owns what security at a given time. So think about like cap table management, for example. So we've effectively taken that model and apply it to private securities, right? So actually, you know, years back, it petitioned the SEC to amend something called Reg ATS. So an ATS is an alternative trading system. So ATSs were born out of something called ECNs, which are electronic crossing networks. So this is back in the the 90s, right? These are firms like Daytech, Archipelago, Instanet, right? And so what they were doing is creating best execution. These were led to the dark pools, right, the proliferation of the dark pools, they became regulated under something called Reg ATS. And so in order to do those, do that functionality, you had to become an ATS with the SEC. And fast forward, we noticed that there was a line in Reg ATS that said our work in private securities is not yet done. So, you know, 10 plus years later, went back and said, look, it's been 10 years, you haven't done anything here. Let's update this, right? And so we were able to purpose the ATS for private securities, not just public securities. So an ATS is, you can kind of think of it similarly to when exchanges like NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. The difference is, you know, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, they're their own self-regulatory organization with an alternative trading system. It's the SEC, right? So that just means that we don't write our own rules. It's the SEC, that writes the rules. How does that extend to your Shopify metaphor? The demand and kind of recognition for public equities is very well understood. And the distribution pathways are also like very oiled and high speed. And there's lots of throughput. People take stocks, put them into a pie chart or an ETF, put those into a pie chart, put that into an asset allocation and so on. Whereas venture investments and art and all the other things you've mentioned, they're just chunky and not necessarily fungible. So how does the private Shopify portal analogy work out? So the the Shopify analogy really pertains to 
So if you are a you know digital merchant trying to sell shirts online, right, instead of having to create your own website from scratch, HTML, CSS, you know, everything like that, and then create your own order management system, your own inventory tracking system, you know, shipping, movement of money, all that sort of things, right? Shopify gives you a set of tools to be able to set that up quickly, right? And so your average person is able to through drag and drop menus execute on their online storefront. So for us, it's the same thing, right? So instead of someone having to go and try and build all of this technology from the primary issuance, so everything from investor onboarding, data rooms, escrow, movement of money, admin functionality, all the way through the secondary trading and multiple trading styles, which may take years, they're able to out of the box take that technology. But then also what's really important is in order to conduct that business of being able to raise capital, being able to fractionalize assets and securitize them, that has to go through a regulated rails of the broker dealer and ATS. So the Shopify example is really taking something that would take someone you know, an order amount of time and bringing that down to a matter of, of weeks, for example. Who are some of the types of clients that you serve? Like who are some of your best clients in terms of, is it issuers or asset managers that have adopted the stack that you've put together? Yeah, so our clients, they're, they're setting up markets, right? So they are originating assets that could be anything from real estate to media, royalties to artwork and everything in between. And they're setting up a, a marketplace in order to fractionalize those assets and be able to bring them to a broad base of investors, right? So it's everything from the primary issuance and capital raising component all the way through secondary trading and having the ability for liquidity. Gotcha. And are there any particular industries in which there is the most traction from the issuer side? Like, is it the startups? Is it the art dealers? Like, where do you see the demand most from? So it's actually been very broad. I wouldn't say that there is one segment in particular. Real estate pops up over and over again. Private equity is becoming heavier. Private credit is also becoming heavier as well. But and then when you go with kind of the more esoteric alternative asset classes, they're pretty evenly distributed. And that's, you know, everything from artwork to collectibles to racehorses. Is there any sort of unification of these different separate pools that exist? You know, so going back to the Shopify example, which I'm sure by now you regret, Shopify started out building marketplaces per merchant, but then ended up pulling all of that stuff together in the shop app so that you have, in fact, like an aggregation of all this commerce in one place. Is there a similar structure where, you know, let's say there's one private equity issuer and then there's another private equity issuer, but then from a user perspective, like there's cross-pollination and it sort of like flows into one big ocean. Absolutely. And that's what Templum One is. We haven't actually formally announced it. So I apologize to Tara, who's our head of marketing. But Templum One is now taking all of these different marketplaces. It is taking asset owners as well. So think or asset managers, so think about like private equity, for example, and putting them all into a central network that is then distributed into the fintech app, the fintech apps, RIA channels, family office investment platforms, independent broker dealers, banks, so on and so forth. Right. So that's where the central operating system that I mentioned earlier comes into play. So we're creating that central fabric. So you could go log on to you know, your online brokerage account, or you can go on to whatever fintech app you use for trading, you know, public equities to crypto and be able to see all the different alternative assets that are listed across the Templum ecosystem and be able to directly execute from that platform. So Templum really is the, you know, the plumbing connecting all the different components of a, you know, what is 13 plus trillion dollar market today. Right. So we're making it as easy to buy alternative assets that is to go and buy a share of Apple. Can you talk a little bit more about the demand side? So you've talked about the supply of assets. On the demand side, you know, you mentioned fintechs and RAs and so on. Which of the channels are working best? And maybe if you could talk about some of the, you know, the personas that are starting to integrate alternatives into their asset allocations or purchasing behavior or financial planning, like 
are we there yet and who is doing it? Yeah, we're, we're absolutely, absolutely there. You know, the 60 40 portfolio construction is historically, it is historic, it's going out the window at this point. You know, in order to capture returns, you're having to go to the, the private market. You know, more and more companies are staying private longer. So you're not able to capture that upside into the public markets today. In terms of the personas and the distribution side, right? So something like, you know, RIAs, private wealth managers, independent broker dealers, right? They're more looking at the fun side of things as opposed to the fintech side of things, right? They're more apt to invest in, you know, individual assets, right? A piece of artwork, a collectible, you know, an individual piece of real estate. And what do you think is driving those behaviors? It's the desire to capture returns, right? So if you look at what's happened from a return profile in the public markets over the last you know, couple of decades, you're not seeing those outsized returns that you saw historically because things are staying private longer. That's one. And then diversification is the other. Individual asset side, especially it's collectibles or artwork, there's kind of an affinity component to it too, right? People feel a connection to those assets. Right. And if you look at venture or private equity, right, those asset classes have been outperforming the public markets for some time now. I agree with you, certainly from the manufacturing side, from the financial professional side, I think that's totally right. I found from the behavioral side, however, like it's really tough. People have no idea. So for example, the story that it's taking longer for companies to go public and it's the venture investor that captures the alpha and by the time the things are public, they just go down. I think now is the the week where all the WeWork numbers are coming out and Adam Newman is worth more than WeWork by an order of magnitude. So I think financial professionals get this, but does direct retail really understand this? Like, There's quite a bit of private equity and venture and hedge funds that are entering the space and targeting like direct distribution. But I'm curious as to like what's happening on the ground with people that they're internalizing the narratives. Yeah, I think people are absolutely recognizing it today. You know, anyone that I talk to absolutely realizes that they want to get into private equity. They want to get into venture. They want to diversify into, you know, asset classes like artwork. I don't think it's a secret anymore that all those asset classes have been outperforming the market. So I think what has been the delay in it is you know, people are knowledgeable about it, but it's their inability to access those different assets. So now we're putting it at people's fingertips, right? And there's always still going to be an education component to it, right? But it, again, it's just been accessibility, right? I mean, look at how people's level of sophistication changed in the public markets when you started having the online brokerages that started coming out around the dot com, right? People were able to actually go have it at their fingertips and do their own research and execute directly as opposed to talking to a broker. Have you done any analysis or sort of simulations of the effect of adding these asset classes to a traditional portfolio? Or certainly the some of the investment advisors that that you work with, I'm sure, try to position it in this way. Like What is the diversification benefit? And maybe also for people who don't know, what are the characteristics of these asset classes? Like how correlated are they with equities? How volatile are they relative to other things? You know, going back to the 60-40 portfolio construction, right? And it was supposed to be, you know, stocks and bonds because there's supposed to be a lack of correlation between them. That recently has gone out the window. But again, if you look at, you know, the returns in private equity or venture as compared to the public equity markets as they rise and fall. There hasn't been a huge direct correlation to that. If you look at, you know, artwork, artwork's been one of the best performing asset classes over the last couple of decades and is not impacted by, you know, public markets or the bond market, for example. So, I mean, there's, there, you know, you go to, you know, you go look up with any of the banks or private equity shops or any of the institutional research firms, right? The data is all there to show the outsized performance that has been seen in the explosion of alternative assets, right? And if you look at even, you know, the traditional asset allocators, right? Pensions, sovereigns, endowments, they've been deploying more and more capital and they want to continue to into the alternative asset space because that's where the returns are, right? The, the issue that they've run into is they've deployed so much capital in the alt space and their portfolio has to be a certain mix of e-liquid versus liquid. 
So they need secondary liquidity and markets like what Templin provides in order to keep deploying further into the alt asset space. And, and because of that kind of bottleneck, that's why you've seen a lot of these alternative asset groups go downstream into you know more of the retail or creds channel to access additional pools of capital. That makes sense in terms of the dynamics. Can you talk a little bit about the alts? fintech ecosystem, you know, over the last five to 10 years, we've seen a number of players kind of take interesting and slightly different positions in the space. And I'm curious as to how Templum thinks about the competitive dynamics, as well as the type of position that you're trying to take, you know, so everything from whether it's iCapital or Forge, like businesses that are very focused on distribution, but might not have sort of the core financial infrastructure that you've assembled. You've brought up Adapar, right, which was kind of built around the idea of performance reporting for alternatives on top of traditional performance reporting for other asset classes. Like, where do you sit in in the fabric of this ecosystem? Like, who are your partners and then who are your competitors? You know, some of those names that we that were just mentioned, we are complementary to them. So what's happening now in the alt space is a need for liquidity mechanisms, right? And so you can see what's happened. The traditional liquidity mechanism has been redemptions. And if you look at what's happened in the REIT space, they've had to throttle that back. They've had outsized demand and redemptions and have not been able to fulfill it. And there's no other optionality for liquidity. And now, especially as you start going into more retail accred, you know, individual investors, that is going to become more and more important. It's one thing for a traditional asset allocator to have to be locked up three, five, 10 years. But when you're dealing with individuals who may have a life-changing event, like they're getting married or buying their first house, or God forbid, they get in a car accident and have medical bills, they can't sit there for three years trying to get their money out through redemptions. So when you start talking about some of those participants that you mentioned before, you know, having a secondary market and ability for liquidity becomes very, very valuable. I think we're at a very an inflection point in the industry now that it's grown so large that it now requires secondary markets for people to be able to exit positions and redeploy capital. Right. If you look at some of the markets that you know haven't necessarily been as successful as they live on their own isolated island, right? Or don't have secondary trading. So they end up tapping out their investor base. Their investors are locked up. There's no liquidity mechanisms. And then customer acquisition costs just start going through the roof. So with Templum and Templum One, now we're able to bring a broader array of investors to those marketplaces and to those assets to both drive more investment, so more asset origination, but then also help drive liquidity too. Got it. So just to explain kind of what I'm understanding. So let's say there's a a REIT or some other real estate fund or private equity fund Traditionally, what I would do is I would subscribe to that fund, they would get my capital, and then if I needed some of the capital back, which they'd be in the business of deploying, I might have to wait six months or longer to get that out. Whereas the mechanism you've built and are proposing is that the interests in that fund become tradable through the ATS-led stack that you have. Exactly. So even if you go and post for a redemption, right, you may want to take out you know, let's say it's $100,000, but then, you know, they'll go back and see how much they can actually do for redemptions. You might be prorated and throttled back to only 30% of what you were trying to take out. All right. And there's usually a quarterly window at best to be able to do so. What do you think are the market implications of adding liquidity to some of these things? Like structurally, do you think anything will change if all of a sudden people are able to much more seamlessly trade around in these asset classes? Absolutely, right? I mean, when you look at deploying capital into investments, you know, you're typically deploying more capital into liquid investments, right? Just from a risk mitigation standpoint. So if something's a liquid, right, that's typically going to be a smaller part of your portfolio construction. So by adding liquidity and be able to enter and exit, you know, more at will, you absolutely will start driving more adoption. I wonder about this from the perspective of the crypto and the token markets, where you combine entrepreneurial activity with very early liquidity and intense speculation pressure. 
And, you know, arguably the assets are much more speculative because they are so early stage and the technology is in many places quite unproven. But the point is that all of a sudden you have people who should be focused on building things and, you know, are vested in for four years and are earning their equity over some sort of time period. And the equity is worthless unless they hit the home run in the first place. All of a sudden, they are exposed to capital markets fluctuations like six months from starting a startup while they're still trying to get to cash flow. And the dynamic of having to deal with the investor relations in this experience, you know, like people are completely out of their depth in having a community of angry investors and volatility. So I wonder if it's a mixed blessing, like if, you know, for the REIT, like what happens when it starts trading way below NAV or for any of these other assets as well? Like what impact does it have on a venture firm if you're taking a 75% haircut during 2022 when all the risk on assets got sliced open? Have you thought about that part or where do you think that will go? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to private company shares and what you're describing and building something and then having effectively you know, being at the whim that is parallel to what you see in the public markets and having to worry about a stock price. You know, that's a market that I kind of put as an outlier for what we're doing in the alt space, right? That That's going to be much more of a kind of, you know, bulletin board style uh, quotation bureau type trading, right? And it'll be controlled liquidity because each one of the document sets inside of those firms too have all of the different ropers and transfer restrictions baked into it that add some complications. But when you're talking about hard assets, you know, like real estate or any other ones that I mentioned before, you know, all that information is all already there, publicly reported, right? All the information on the, the REIT side of it, they have to report all of that sort of stuff. You know, I think there will be a shift in terms of, you know, how NAB is calculated on some of these REITs. I think some of these REITs, they are, the NAB is a little artificially high. And again, they're in a unique position, just what's happening in the commercial real estate market, even multifamily market today. But again, when you start talking about other assets, whether it's music royalties or agriculture or any of these hard assets, you know, you're not necessarily facing those problems, right? They're not, they're not building something. You're having a hard asset that's, you know, already in place. Are we going to get to a place where like the 60-40 portfolio is actually 60% alternatives and 40% old, boring ETFs? I would love to see it. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get to 60%, but if we get to 60%, I'll be very happy. <laughs> and part of that question is like, what's the destination? Where does it get to? Like, is there like a um, New York Stock Exchange size infrastructure or size volume for all of these asset classes? Is that kind of where you're thinking this is going to land? I think so, yes, over time. I mean, really, you are... So you have, if you look at New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and the publicly traded companies and how many are on that platform versus what the alternative asset ecosystem is, really the alternative asset ecosystem is you know everything under the sun. You could effectively fractionalize everything. I'm not saying everything should be, but you know, let's talk about let's move past the you know individual real estate assets, right? What you can start doing is actually then start creating indexes and indices on top of it, right? So I could be Long Upper East Side and Short Soho, for example, right? So there's a slew of financial products that can be built on top of uh, what exists today on the hard asset side. What is the financial model, the economic model for the firm? Like what makes you succeed? Is it money in motion or money at rest? Are you trying to generate volume and transactions or is it growing assets? It's a combination of both, right? I think one feeds the other. There is a flywheel effect to it. You know, Temple, there's the software licensing fees, and then there's also the commissions around trading as well, right? So we have a little bit of mix from our economic model, but in terms of how this industry grows, right? More assets means more trading, means more liquidity, and it feeds on itself. Absolutely. Well, one day, I hope you do come back also to the digital assets world. I feel like right now there's a resurgence in the tokenization of real world assets across the industry. So the themes of security tokens, of putting, you know, bonds on chain or or treasuries on chain has come back as a 
big focus, especially for for banks that have had enterprise blockchain programs now running for you know four or five years. Have you tracked that bit of the industry at all, the real world assets part? And if anything, do you have a view on how that's going to evolve? Absolutely. Right. So we still are there primed, ready, have the approvals to be able to conduct that business. There, you know, the fact of the matter is right now in the way that regulation works and the existing infrastructure, right? So custodians, for example, it's not there to actually facilitate the market. So even if you do want to do a security token right now, you it, it ends up being more expensive. You're basically creating a mirrored security where the actual true security is not on the blockchain. So it's mirrored. It adds an extra point of failure. And it still has to go through the transfer agents, the custodians, the broker deal, the ATS. So it's not really fully decentralized under the current securities framework. So I couldn't take my asset, self-custody it, and go trade it on any ATS, for example, right? It has to be an ATS designated inside of the filing of that asset. That's one of the issues. The other big one, I'm actually working with one of the biggest layer ones right now and one of the biggest custodians, is there's actually not a custodian today that supports tokenized securities. There was, it's no longer around. So there's now a huge gap inside of the market to be able to facilitate that. Some of these institutional you know, blockchain applications that have occurred are more on the information side of things than actually a true token and are being kind of you know, traded or held inside of a walled garden. So it doesn't actually maximize the potential of what blockchain is. And I've been, you know, proponent of blockchain going back before tokens, right? And, you know, all blockchain is really is it's a singly linked list, N equals one database that has object-oriented programming baked into it. So if regulation changes, custodian comes into play, all, and it becomes more efficient. We just basically take what exists today on the system and port it into effectively another database. So I hope it occurs. But you know where things are currently, and this is the rabbit hole before we got in the call that I was talking about, we can go down. Unfortunately, all the components just aren't there today. But we are one of the solutions when the rest of the dominoes fall to help facilitate that market. Absolutely, that makes sense. Over time, the distinction between all the different asset classes as we kind of meld into the machine rails will go away. It's just extremely, extremely painful and slow and difficult to get there and takes a lot of actual blocking and tackling like you've done to set that up. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. If we want our audience to learn more about you or about Templum, where should they go? TemplumInc.com. Fantastic. Thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.